that you recorded and that the um, not well applied, um, especially if we back to each other. Um, I posted a link to the minutes and to the work in progress minutes in the chat. Um, would someone volunteer to add a few things in there, given that Barry is still on vacation and won't join, join me as, uh, in sharing this today? Please. Well, I, I can I can type something in, but then I probably will also be talking occasionally. Yeah, that's what I anticipate. Yes, I I will help out. Very much appreciated. Oh, thank you. Um, I um wrote in one point into the agenda just for brief um, mention link because. It's Come up over the last few days. Uh, there are good comments coming in, in during the OID review, and Carsten, as Santa already mentioned, has already lectured on them. So um, I think I think that things are in a, in a good shape and can continue there. And one one would like would like to comment on this. Or... Um. Otherwise, um, we've, um, we've put, um, I've had to leave out uh, Carsten of Carsten's last slot during the uh, physical IDF meeting, or the virtual IDF meeting that we've had. Um, so I'd like you to ask you, Carsten, to basically continue where we left you out. Um, and I think I can show the slides if you want to, but it will take me a moment to have them online. Okay, I'm I'm totally unprepared, but I hope I can remember what these were about. <laughs> so the two the two two big uh, topics were uh, CDDL user uh, and the question of how to ex whether we want to do anything about the 128 bit values that could be expressed using the uh, using one of the of the reserved um, values or whether that's better handled by just doing tag extension. Yes, then can you try to increase the, the distance between your microphone and your keyboard? Um, sorry, I can mute my, I can mute myself. While yeah, but it, it's just, just bad. If, if you're saying something and typing at the same time, uh, you are still hard I'm to I'm painfully aware of that, but I recently lost part of my hardware setup, so I had to resort to this tag. Yeah, you probably need to to put up a website that that shows how to do a good conferencing setup. I have all the parts. Usually, I just lost one of them. <laughs> okay. Good. So you wanted to show some slides? Yes, I'm in the process of doing that, and that should. And should be should we point the right to now. the? Should we point to the meeting minutes and mention that people should sign up there? Because we're um, not using Meet Echo. The meeting minutes, um, the meeting minutes um, I sent out chat. Um, but yes, please, um, thanks for the reminder. Um, please add your name there. Thank you. And I think I'm showing your slides of last ITF now. You are showing a white screen. Damn it, I tried this out before. <laughs> um, that, okay, that sometimes um, happens post, in WebEx. Um, I posted the links to the to the slides. I think that's best I yeah. can do on, on short notice unless someone wants to take the ball and has better confidence that, um, in, in their setup than I have. Um, and I'll just put slide numbers in, uh, and we just put slide numbers in the chat. So the, um, the link is in there and the part should, uh, and the relevant part should start on this time. <laughs> So should I try to share that from, from my box? If 
try to share them custom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if somebody can remind me how to go full screen here, was it that one? Uh, whatever. So can you see what I'm trying to share? Yes. yes. Just Good. fine. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so th these were slides I, I made a, a month ago. And so I, I will have to <laughs> remember what I wanted to say to them. Um, so uh, one one document that uh, we generated at the time when when CDL, CDDL was being completed uh, was the freezer document, which contains uh, uh, various uh, components that didn't make it into eighty six ten, but that potentially could become uh, uh, useful in in the next round uh, of the working group, and and obviously we are in the next. Uh, round. So, uh, um, yeah, so th this document hasn't really changed very much, except that the the uh, computed literals and dot .abnf part now is its own document, the dash control uh, uh, document, cddl dash control. So that, that is uh, in good shape. Now and and there there is uh, one implementation uh, out there, so I think we we can move forward with that. But um, back to the the freezer document <coughs> that actually has a couple more uh, controls that that uh, maybe are less urgent, but occasionally occasionally people ask about things like like PCIe regular expressions about uh, ways to, to support various forms of endianness and about bit fields. And, and finally, just a couple of weeks or a week ago, uh, Tony Lee asked about uh, bit fields in Yang. So it, it's uh, uh, something that, that does come up again and again. Uh, but right now, um, I'm, I'm not seeing uh, people having a, a good use case um, and I think it's, it's best to define these controls at a time when you actually have the use case. So I think we, these are living well in the freezer uh, document, and we can pull them out when, whenever it turns out somebody has a use case and, and we can turn them into a document. Um, the, the third item in the freezer uh, document is... Uh, standard way to represent a CDDL parse tree in JSON. And that is actually implemented in the CDDLC uh, tool. And um, that, that has already turned out to be very useful. But on the other hand, there's maybe not a strong reason to standardize that now. But we can also leave that in the freezer document uh, for a while and and uh, uh, see when when we actually want to to bless it and say this this is something that we know all agree is the best way to represent it. And uh, what happened since the freezer document was written is that um, I have a slightly um, uh, cooked form of of that. So uh, th what's in the document right now is really pretty much the raw pass tree. And I have a slightly cooked form where the the um, rules are um, potentially combined. Um, so if you have uh, something like uh, slash equals or slash slash equals, um, that that is turned into a single rule. So it's a bit more easy to uh, process this. You don't have to, to write code to, to combine uh, the rules. But on the other hand, of course, it's it's harder to go back from that to the uh, original CDDL source. Uh, so I think both representations are useful, uh, but the cooked form is, is maybe something that, that's more useful in a tool that, for instance, wants to convert into a, 
a different language uh, that, that doesn't have the, the slash equals or slash slash uh, equals uh, form. So I, I still need to document that. Um, uh, but um, um, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty obvious what, what that uh, part of CDDLC does. So th th this is um, item one is done. Item two and three are, are good things to, to leave in the freezer document for now. And uh, item four, uh, this is really where we, we uh, need to continue uh, for uh, CDDL 2.0. And uh, th th there are three, three major groups here. Uh, one is a brief discussion of a module superstructure. And I think most people who have been working on, on larger sets of CDDL, in particular in the RADS uh, context, uh, would agree that we need to do something very soon. That's why this is in purple. Uh, and then we have co-occurrence constraints and literal syntaxes. And uh, literal syntaxes is maybe the, the least needed of these. So uh, I think we are mostly waiting for strong use cases uh, there. Co-occurrence uh, constraints. Um, actually, in, in a review I just did, um, I already forget what, what was it, ECMI? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so th they had an interesting case where they had a map, and everything in the map was optional. But then there had to be at least one element in the map. And it turns out that, that we actually can express that. Um, but I think more, more examples like these are going to, to uh, uh, come up. Uh, so saying something like, here's a field, and that field needs to be a multiple of that other field. Um, and so on. So um, yeah, again, if, if, if you are writing CDDL and find out you are missing something here, you would like to be able to express a constraint, but don't have the, the means in the language, it would be good to, to let the CBO uh, mailing list know so we can start thinking about uh, what, what CDL should do there. <clears throat> so essentially, what remains is the, the module super, superstructure thing that really needs work uh, now. And um, I think what has happened is that uh, people who would be needing this now have come up with a naming convention <clears throat> that, that already feels a little bit like namespaces. Um, so they are using something like a module dot um, name a, as a, a structure for a name and um, we may want to make this a little bit more um, yeah f turn this from a convention uh, into something that's actually supported so you don't have to type as much um, and, and you, you get less noisy specifications by having this namespace prefix added uh, automatically. And that would be handled in an export-import interface. And I think that that's the next area where, where we need to uh, collect uh, formative uh, contributions. So that's my summary where we are with this uh, uh, document. Um, yeah, um, so I think I... Um, said that we could extract the, the CDL and JSON interface uh, at any time if we want to, and that we, we need to work on the uh, superstructure. And if people could, could uh, just essentially explain their pain points from, from their specification work, uh, we could come up with, with good use cases. I think Hank is in a parallel meeting. Yeah, he's not here uh, because he, he told me about his pain points already. So I, I don't see a need for the working group to adopt this document or anything. Uh, 
if we want to adopt something, it should be something that that's coming out of the freezer and is being thought and and uh, uh, put into a document we want to progress. Modules infrastructure sounds something that would make very much sense to thank you, yeah. As as something to throw up and then propose as a working group document. So what one other thing that, that came up uh, recently is that um, most documents that do something like like define tags or something like that um, actually would benefit from from uh, being able to add to the pre, uh, prelude, but of course the the prelude is is defined uh, to to be um, constant. There's uh, nothing can be added to the prelude because it would uh, possibly conflict. Uh, with namespaces in existing uh, documents. And th that's also something where the module structure could help because you could just uh, include the the uh, prelude component that, that uh, comes from a particular uh, standard and uh, have that available in, in your CDDL specification. So would that mean that, uh, that you replace the prelude or that you just import at the start of your document the prelude of the biggest document that you use and then import selectively from the other documents that you use. Yeah, I think it, it needs to be a mix and match thing. So you, you, you cannot um, really, I mean, you, you could do a CDL 2.0 and that, that has just a different prelude. And, and if you port something from, so yeah, one zero to two zero, you have to to clean your namespaces. Um, but I think the 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 inverse direction is probably the best one, where we start actually treating the prelude as another namespace, and have that implicitly uh, imported. So we we don't have a big difference between um, the prelude and other uh, modules that that are. Uh, being imported. So the, the import interface, for instance, would allow you to rename something that is in the prelude or um, yeah, something like that. Um, so um, yeah, may maybe we need to, to spend a little time uh, actually making some some uh, straw man proposals and, and discuss this in, in an interim uh, meeting. Maybe maybe in in uh, four four weeks or something like that. Sounds good to me. Um, now from, from from the group, um, do you do you um, do do you have documents you've worked on where you where a particular set of statements would come to to mind where that you would like to um, introduce? Introduced for more general purpose consumption, where you could try out what is what is being developed here. So that that's that's definitely something where we would need to see a bit more. We would, we if if this is. To go on the working group, I think we'll have we'll have to have some examples, but I'm confident that as this goes along, um, we can find them. Especially with the documents like like you mentioned of, of Hank, where this would be useful. One thing that that we could try to do to make some progress on this is actually collect pointers to to various CDDA specifications. So we we now have enough within the IETF we can point to that we can use that as, as a kind of uh, corpus to to try things out. Um, so maybe we should have a wiki page somewhere where we collect this. If you remember, Jim and I had done this uh, uh, questionnaire and I had interviewed uh, a lot of people. Now I guess that the documents that you see the DL are even more those that we uh, we looked at but 
could be a start. I I ended up I never ended up putting it on um, any place, but I think I shared it with you, Karsten. This could be on. Yeah. It's still on it's paper cool. and it needs to be like <laughs> written down. So maybe I should just open a, a repository um, with uh, where I collect examples uh, from people and uh, where, where we also have a wiki page where, where people can can write write up things that, that they care about. Yeah, otherwise uh, something that uh, another working group is using, uh, HTTP bis, have started using uh, discussions. So for, yeah. yeah, I don't know if that's also something. Discussions in, in, in which sense? Sorry, GitHub discussions. So it's instead of a wiki, it's they're using this. I'm not really familiar with it, but they are using it to uh, gather input from um, fr from users, uh, implementers, etc. I don't really know how it's structured, but it might be worth checking it out if it's simpler yeah. than a wiki. Yeah, let's look at what they're doing. Maybe it can work for. Yeah, wiki is, is good for actually collecting results of, of things like GitHub discussions, but GitHub discussions is a little bit uh, the replacement for the the Slack uh, features that, that a lot of people have been uh, asking uh, we should have. Yeah, so if, if, if you... If the chairs can can give me some license for for setting something up, uh, I will try uh, doing that, and maybe I can yes, please, please fi find a find a way to do GitHub discussions in there. Okay, so that that should be the CDL freezer part. Uh, then there was uh, uh, a question. I already forgot who who put it in, uh, but the the question was um, how do we handle uh, one hundred twenty eight bit entities? So when when we defined Cibo in in two thousand thirteen, uh, we said sixty four bit is enough for everyone. No, that's of course not what we said, but um, we said that, that this is really the, the basic data model uh, can stop at 64-bit, and if we need something larger, uh, we can put it in. And actually for integers, uh, we already put that in, uh, in, in the form of big nums. So um, I don't think we need uh, um, something like... like uh, um, 128 bit tags <laughs> or 128 bit array sizes or, or uh, something like that. Uh, that doesn't make sense. Um, so we, we have tag two, three big nums for uh, 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 integers that are larger than 64 bits. We have tag five that can handle float 128, but it looks different than what people probably will find in their um, platforms. So you would have to write a lot of code to uh, uh, copy over uh, binary 128, IEEE 754 um, into tag five. We do have a, a tag 83, for arrays of float 128. Uh, and of course, you can always send an array of one uh, to, to send a single float uh, 28, 128. Uh, but then, of course, you, you would not know whether this actually was intended as an array um, or uh, th this actually is meant to be a single float 128. 
So w one way to, to handle this specific requirement uh, would be to define uh, tags specifically for float 128 and probably float 256 just to be um, a little bit future proof. Uh, the, the other way to address this, of course, is to open Pandora's box and say, okay, we, we extend CBOR uh, to allow 128-bit um, uh, data um, in, in the argument part, uh, not, not in the um, content part like, like, like uh, tag 2.3 do, but in the argument part. Uh, but uh, I think the the only data type that actually can use this at this point in time would be float. And we may be better off with spending another byte or two and uh, using a tag. So that's where I am. And of course, it would be good if, if the working group um, can... can um, um, check whether that, that's a common understanding or whether uh, actually people are longing for being able to use 128-bit uh, uh, items uh, uh, the same way they can use 64-bit items. Emil, I think you brought this up originally. What what's your use case? What's the use case you you've been looking at? Hello, this is Emil. Can you hear me? Yeah. My use case, um, which I cover in the link I pasted in the chat, was uh, when receiving a typed array of 128-bit floats. Uh, and transcoding them uh, where the receiver doesn't understand typed arrays. So uh, this is this came up as a part of me working on a uh, C++ library for uh, encoding and decoding CBOR. So I my library supports typed arrays. Um, and when uh, I transcode, by transcode, I mean um, the encoder and decoder aren't exactly the same. For example, uh, the sender to me could understand typed arrays, but the receiver from me doesn't understand typed arrays. I hope I'm making myself clear here. Yep. Um, so I currently can handle all uh, typed array cases except for the 128-bit float. So for example, if I receive a uh, typed array of 16-bit integers, I'll transcode them into a regular array of 16-bit integers and, and so on. But I, I just get stuck for the 128-bit uh, 128-bit float case. Now, I've, I, like Carson mentioned, I could use tag five, but then there's a lot of tricky computation involved. I'd like to be able to just encode it as uh, an IEEE format uh, in, in the same raw bytes. Um, and I, 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 I'd be happy with just a tag instead of... Uh, extending uh, the standard uh, floating point value. Would a, would a tag really help in your use case, given that you that you don't know what, given, given that you are in a situation where it's configured what the other party are supposed and what not? I mean, you currently consider the case where you're converting to someone who doesn't support the array tag for, the, the tag for arrays, um, but if that that receiving party then doesn't support the tag for float for 128-bit float either, it puts you in a similar situation to the extent where um, a requirement might be might just be that um, if you support float 128, please also support arrays because I mean, as, as Carson mentioned with tag 83, that would be 
one way even of, ex of extracting those uh, those 128 bit codes in the first place. Yes, I understand what you're saying. Let's let's say we invent a new tag. Uh, I'm just pulling a number out of the air here. A tag 128. Uh, if the receiver doesn't understand tag 83, what makes you say they would understand 128? Right. Yeah. yeah, I get you. What I what I'm doing so far is I'm transcoding as a uh, byte array without any tags, with the hopes that the receiver can somehow do something with that. Yeah, the the problem remains that uh, uh, if we encode uh, float one twenty eight as uh, uh, tag 83, then we lose the distinction between having a single value and an array of values, which may, may be important uh, in, in a particular um, application data model. Um, so I think uh, at some point we will have to bite the bullet and, and provide a way uh, to tag something as, as a uh, binary 128 uh, floating point. Fortunately, nobody has uh, found a need for the decimals that are in 754, so those could come up at some point as well. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think these are kind of a very special uh, use case. But the 128 floating point actually is getting more and more common in, in applications. But at least, as I understand you, Emil, you don't have so much of a use case for the particular situation, but just for making a complete converter. What was the last part of your sentence? Um, but it's just about having a complete converter and not you, you don't really run across the, the code 128. Kind That's of, correct. In, in, okay. So, so kind of, we see it coming up, but we don't have the, the urgent need to have something usable right now. That would be my understanding from you. I concur it's not urgent for my case. Yeah, but then we are trying to be a battery included standard, yeah. so. Would there be much more to 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 this endeavor of including those batteries than defining those two or those one or two tags with their with their semantics and be done with it? I mean, this if, if if it's just about defining the tags, it may not even require any standard action, but just someone writing it up and uh, then Carson pointing it out in the in the notable text. Yeah, I was already thinking about simply proposing that, that I uh, write uh, a quick section about larger floating point in notable tags and, and uh, put in the IANA registration requests. If we do um, add new tags, for uh, binary 128, could someone come along and say, well, I want tags for um, big integers expressed as two's complement? I mean, that, that's actually way too easy to convert in, into tag three, so. Uh... Okay, just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a good question, but I think it's really easy to convert uh, two's complement uh, in into the uh, value plus sign uh, structure of tag two and three. Yeah. Uh, so, Emil, since since you have happen to know C plus plus quite well, 
Um, is there any C++ support for binary, uh, binary 256 at this point in time? Not that I'm aware of. There's, there's not even official support for 128. They're uh, language extensions. Yeah. Okay, but I think GCC and, and uh, Clang both have something there. Uh, GCC does, I believe. Okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, I think my suggestion would be to just go ahead and uh, define a tag for uh, binary 128. And uh, um, th that's probably still a one plus one tag, even though 128 bits already is pretty large. Um, but then they, they tend to come in, in large numbers. <laughs> in which case, you can put them in, a, in an area. Yeah, except that uh, what you actually need, maybe a map uh, or something else. So, yeah, we, we can discuss that one on the list, I think. Yep. Sounds good to me. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that completes the slides that I had. Yeah. Um, you, funny thing, you, you already um, hinted at one of the other points that we, we still have on the on the list that I put there, basically because it came up it came up on the mailing list uh, on on and on, on one of the earlier slides. Um, my impression from the from the discussion was in the direction that yeah, I mean one could do that, but interoperability would be so it it would be non interoperable. So um, there's only so much you can do um, without breaking the ecosystem. Um, is, is there much more to that discussion? Is that something that we expect to continue? Is there, are there voices here that want, that haven't been heard on many years? Opinions? Well, I know at least one design win that we didn't get because Cibo is big Indian. Um, so th those things happen, um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I think the the cost of actually splitting the the Cibor universe into a big Indian part and a little Indian part uh, also is quite high. Um, so um, I think we we haven't reached the threshold. Uh, where we actually would need to to exercise that split. It might make sense to point that out in some place, and if it's only the wiki or the FAQ, uh, some, some FAQ-ish place where we could say that we've considered it, there's not enough momentum, but if it were to be done, it could be done this or that way. Or would that be fueling the the the, uh, the momentum towards that split? Well, explaining that there's very little text in in eighty nine forty nine uh, giving the rational uh, for this, and of course the the rational is that uh, most of us have experience. Uh, both with uh, standards that um, actually defined a single endianess and standards that allowed both. And uh, those usually are, are uh, pretty icky. So I, I remember the X window system uh, where uh, essentially the, the two sides at the start try to find out whether they are having, uh, they are using the same endian and then switch to that if, if it's the same. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that was a pain in, in all the tools that, that did something with uh, 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 the X-Window system because it's a, a kind of a stateful decision and so on. So I, I don't think today 
people would do that again for the X window system. Big Endian spacecraft. My Jabba client crashed. That was my comment in in Jabber. That as far as I understand, the all of our Mars robots are Big Endian. And if 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 I were to imagine a long term use of of Seabor, you know, interplanetary craft is kind of one of the places I would think it would be. You, if you were inventing it now, you would do this and you would care about uh, not having to swap bytes. Um, and as far as I can tell, they're all big Indian. Yeah, I think most IoT platforms we are working with today are little Indian. But on the other That's hand, um, I think that, that the code that actually... Uh, generates uh, uh, arguments um, in in different sizes. Uh, that code can also handle the endianness Indian, uh, with very little additional overhead. Um, so I, I don't think there's really a, a that strong argument. I think it's mostly cognitive dissonance. It's not not uh, actually. A technical problem. It's just it could be done. So why aren't we doing it? One point that came up was that that it's uh, uh, that it's inefficient in WebAssembly because it doesn't have the byte for instructions that we have on, on all the other platforms. Um, maybe it would help if is, is anyone around with implementation experience with WebAssembly and could maybe come up with a very small benchmark. I have never used byte swap instructions in in my code, so I. You have a compiler. For that. Yes, and the compiler hasn't emitted byte swap instructions either. Oh. I'm I'm not using the equivalent of uh, N2HL or something like that in in the code that uh, reads or writes arguments. And people are not coding WebAssembly by hand, I hope. Yes, but I think the expectation there was that if you if you build your code um, for regular, a regular platform, um, then the compiler would just emit the bytes of instruction if it sees you read from there and write from there and then write in the other direction. Um, and that's not an option on WebAssembly. Sounds a lot like premature optimization, but if we have anything to point at in terms of efficiency, that might help to say, yeah, yes, it does make a difference, but not one that you'd have in it, which I think is the, the line here. More voices, more comments. So the conclusion here seems to be that, that there is just no momentum here to do anything about this. So the best we can do is document some, write a bit more about the rationale if we found time to and then move on. Yeah, and the momentum isn't there because we are lazy, but uh, because we think that the cost is larger than the benefit. Yeah, good point. Okay, um, then there's one more proposed um, topic for the agenda, that's the topic of um, enumerated alternatives. Um, Carsten, you link to the um, to the proposal text um, with, um, with the basically with the words around it that it's not something that needs to concern the 
list, but at some point there will be at least an expert need to be an expert opinion on this uh, in terms of allocating tags. Um, would you like to say a bit about that, or just pointing at the document and asking people to read? Yeah, I think it, it, I just wanted to to make sure that people are aware about this, and and if they have related use cases, uh, maybe they bring that to to the table. I think that the tag consumption of of this um, uh, proposal is is uh, rather modest, uh, and it solves a, a real problem in in. Uh, uh, the way compilers could be using uh, CBOR. Uh, so I think it, it's a good idea to support uh, this. And so I would uh, like to go ahead and, and uh, get these registered. Um. I see a bit in, in, in terms of allocating several proof points, I see a bit of overlap with compression in the sense that this enumeration is might be equivalent to a, a compressed form of a longer explanation that says this is a data item that has type this and value that. Um, do you see that overlap as well? Or is that just um, me pushing too many things together? But it's it's not an equivalent of a longer um, CBOR structure. It really is uh, uh, introducing a number space that is meant to be managed by a compiler. So I think that that's quite separate. Okay. Do you envision that there should be any form of indication of what, um, which set of possibilities this is about, so that it that would either go before the tag or before the document, saying that we are using those tags in this or that sense? I don't think that's what these compilers would be using. Okay. So, so g given that this is being used from a strongly typed uh, environment, the, the uh, compiler actually knows uh, what structure uh, any any alternative has. So, the the compiler implicitly has a schema, even though that is never um, expressed as a schema in in that sense. It's just part of the the original program. Um, so you you wouldn't want to include um, such information in the interchange. Um, of course, if if uh, um, code that that is um, being generated by one of these compilers wants to interoperate with some code written for another platform, uh, yeah, then then you would actually go ahead and and. Uh, write up something like a schema. Uh, but again, I think all the information could be in the schema. Okay, that, that, that's answer my question. Um, for the invitation to everyone stands, please, please read this, form an opinion, and let that's a group note. This is Emil here. May I make a comment? Sure. Uh, first of all, uh, that proposal, I can see that being very useful to encode uh, optional values, uh, where one alternative is null and the other is whatever value or structure, or also for encoding uh, what we call variants in C++, or other languages might call it a tagged union, where um, 
it's a possible limited set of data types uh, that occupies the same space in memory. Um, so those would be use cases uh, in C++ or any other language that supports optionals or variants. Another uh, question I had was, uh, instead of tags, was it considered to have, uh, instead of a whole set of tags, was it considered to have a single tag with uh, an array of two elements with the first element being the alternative number and the second element being the uh, data item? That, that's actually in there. That's the tag 102. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the proposal is to have uh, 128 tags from, from two different spaces. Uh, that are a very efficient way uh, to indicate that the union tag. And uh, when that is not enough, I mean, you, you never want to have artificial limitations in, in a tool like this. Uh, then there is the tag 102 to actually have more than 128 uh, different variants. Oh, I missed that part. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but you, you you point out one one case that also came to my mind that uh, that uh, optionality um, is that also a case where we would use this or is this more a case where we would like I mean, in, on on many written out protocols there's the option to have a null somewhere or some particularly typed value for many for many nullables or for, for many cases where an application would have an option, it would be clear from the type that if there is something else that's not null, that would be something. Um, would it make any sense to treat this as a common special case, which is which can then map to, say, Haskell's uh, maybe or Rust uh, option or the, the optional that you mentioned? I think that that's actually a good uh, question to ask Duncan and, and Michael. Um, because, uh, of course, things like maybe exist, so uh, they, they probably have a concept how maybe should be uh, translated into CBOR. So I, I'll take an action to, to ask the authors of this uh, specification. Uh, just which specification? Of, of the Google Docs document that, that we're looking at. Any more comments on this particular item? Protect union. Any any other business that um, should have been on the agenda that you want to mention, uh, promote, plug, give um, give give pass pass on for everyone to think about. Well, we submitted this. Uh map-like structures uh, draft uh, over the, the Easter weekend. And uh, uh, yeah, it would be good to get some, some feedback uh, for that. I already have some feedback that will uh, probably make a dash uh, one uh, useful. Um, but it would be good to hear from people whether they, they think this is a good solution to this general problem. Uh, the, the draft not only defines uh, the CBOR tags, but it also defines a way to specify these things in CDDL. So we, we should think about um, w whether that's the way we want it. And uh, in the discussion on the mailing list, I also pointed to an older uh, mail uh, about a year old uh, that kind of opened up the whole space 
on the representation side. So, so the, the draft right now um, opens up the space on the semantics side. Uh, but uh, for for some semantics, there, there are different representations uh, to choose from, and that's not something that the draft currently is addressing. So that that's another question: um, Do people think that these representations uh, actually add something, or is this a uh, uh, little bit like like Andeanness uh, uh, introducing additional choice that that in the end will only hinder interoperability. I'll try to pick all the links for this into the minutes. Um, and, yeah. So the, the discussion of that is really old. So, so the, the first applications of um, CDDL, excuse me, of CBOR, uh, for for management in the constraint space, uh, ran into that uh, before we we finally decided we we just wanted to have a, a Yang representation in in Seaboard, so we we kind of lost uh, uh, that, that that fell out of our collective uh, consciousness. Um, so uh, we we have some some existing examples for for wanting to uh, use that, and it would be good to hear whether people still have that, uh, whether they are maybe are workarounds that everybody is using at the moment, and we we just need to uh, identify. So my my hope would be to to. Uh, propose working group adoption of this document in one of the next uh, interims. Sounds like a good way forward to me. Okay. Anyone else? Then I'd like to say uh, thank you all for your input. Um, as usual, I'll send out a mail with the um, pointing to the pointing to the minutes. Uh, sorry for the con confusion at the start and about uh, around the presentation. Thanks to Francesca for helping with minutes and reach you on the mailing list and see you at later in two weeks. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.